So the, I'm going to present a um, short overview of this review paper that uh, I've been going through over the last couple of weeks. Um, I, th there's a lot of, this paper cites a lot of papers uh, and they go into a lot of depth here and there, but I tried to keep this as short and to the point as possible so that we can extract the, the main parts from here. Um, the paper was uh, published about two years ago and it generally, as, as I interpret it, it comes in two parts. So the first is about um, current attempts at continual learning that people mostly in the neural network community have worked on. So that, that includes um, uh, changing levels of plasticity in the parameters, um, adding additional neural units to the networks and um, complementary learning systems that generally, they broadly categorize all attempts into those three different areas. And then finally, part two is um, uh, they make a case for lifelong learning agents and the different pillars of lifelong learning that um, that they think are essential to uh, to have to I guess solving continual learning and I think this part is interesting because it ties in with some of the work that um, Lucas has started doing on embodied AI. Okay, so I'll jump right into part one, which is uh, the three types of three main types of approaches towards uh, continual learning. And so first is regulating levels of plasticity, and this uh, so so here what we have is um, the amount that parameters can change in a, uh, in a neural network as it trains, trains over time, this is regulated by the objective function. So um, elastic weight consolidation was probably perhaps the first uh, notable example of this. And then um, these other two papers followed up and they're similar in spirit, where what you have is uh, if you have a learner that's, um, that's learned a task, Right, and so if you think about the weight space, um, your learner will be here, right? And so this this whole this gray blob here is all the areas where it, it's performing well on your on task A. Then it wants to move on to task B. Um, in elastic weight consolidation, they say what would generally happen is that it would follow um, perhaps the blue uh, the, the trajectory to the next point in weight space would perhaps follow this blue arrow here to get somewhere here. But what they're doing is they're constraining um, the weights so that it ends up moving somewhere here where you're performing well on task A and task B. And how they're doing that is uh, through um, determining which weights can change and which weights can change. And that's determined, um, they all have different methods here. For example, in elastic weight consolidation, I think they use um, Fisher information to determine which weights are important and which weights aren't so important towards the task. So, you can, so one way to think about it here is that you know, some weights may be stronger. And when I say stronger, I mean, in the sense that it's harder to change them as the network tries to learn uh, subsequent tasks. But one shortcoming, or I guess two shortcomings with this is that as you learn more and more tasks, you're starting to constrain more and more weights because these set of weights are going to be more important for task A and another set of weights are going to be more important for task B and, and so on until you reach a point where not many uh, weights can change at all. So it's harder to learn, you know, task number 20, for example. And, um, uh, and, then, the, and then the other uh, part here is that, you know, there might not even be a place in your weight space where uh, it's be able it's able to perform well on both tasks simultaneously if you're using all your parameters like this. So, um, but but in general, I think um, they've shown that it it has performed well on things like um, split MNIST, for example. But I have noticed in that case too, they have like two hidden layers in their network, so it's quite it seems like they, they have more capacity than you would generally need to just simply do that task. The next method is um, allocating additional resources. So in, in all these cases, what they're doing is the network is actually expanding its architecture. So uh, in the first type of case, um, they have progressive neural networks where all they're doing is they're adding a bunch of new units on the side. And uh, every time you learn a new task, you just add a new units and that ends up uh, learning the weights for the new task. And you don't even um, change the original ones. Now the problem, or I guess, uh, okay, and then the, another, Variant of that is instead of tra training everything or, or instead of always adding new units, you can add, sometimes you can add new units and you can even combine them with um, older units that have already been trained. And that uh, is beneficial in the sense that you're using more distributed representations here and not, and you're not always, and you're probably not gonna add as many new units here as, as you do in this case. But of course, the disadvantage here is that your model complexity grows with the number of tasks. And um, and actually, they make a case for being able to train subnetworks. And I guess this is something we're really looking into right now too, training subnetworks to learn each new task in sequence. But 
uh, but there's no mention of sparsity or anything here. So I guess this is why uh, it ends up it ends up hitting 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 a wall eventually. The last one uh, is the idea of complementary learning system theory, which uh, states um, that uh, the hippocampus is used to learn uh, or is primarily learns a lot faster than the cortex learns. And so in, in here, the you know if, if you have a task, the hippo hippocampus will learn uh, it uh, at, uh, at a faster rate than cortex will. And eventually you uh, sort of consolidate this knowledge between the two parts so that it uh, sort of, it doesn't forget once uh, you move on to um, other, once you move on to other tasks and that knowledge gets consolidated somehow. I'm gonna highlight just two methods here that uh, sort of build on this idea. So the first one was um, developed by Jeff Hinton back in the eighties. And so in his, in his um, model, he had between every, I guess every every weight actually was was two different weights. One was a fast weight and one was a slow weight, which changed a lot slower. And so the fast weight, you can think of it as having a higher learning rate. It's um, learning the task that's at hand and not worrying about what it learned before at all. And then slow weight is sort of aggregating all that was learned over a whole learning trajectory, and um, through and then it's it and then the knowledge. I guess what what the fast weight is learning over time, it gets consolidated. Uh, into the slow weight. Now, I'm not sure about the details on exactly how this is done, um, but they have, but yeah. And then another one um, that I thought was a bit interesting was this idea of, so, so I guess this other method here actually um, took, basically created a neural network out of both the, the hippocampal parts and the cortex parts. So they have a PFC network and a hippocampal network. And um, what they're doing here is, Every time they have, they want their model to make a prediction. They're they're sending the outputs. They're they're using both to predict, but then um, then the output goes to this to this other network, uh, BLA network, which is basal lateral amygdala network, and that is deciding which um, which network should be used for the output. Um, and ultimately they have, uh, I guess between tasks, they have like what they call us, what they refer to as a sleep phase where they're consolidating um, uh, whatever the PFC network has learned into the, or no, sorry, consolidating whatever the hippocampal network has learned into the into PFC network. These, so are they actually switching, uh, routing data between two different networks there? Um, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, the, the way you've said it, it sounds like somehow they're routing the data in between the two PFC networks that are shown here. Like it tries oh, to decide are, are about, which network is more applicable to, to a particular task. Is that right? Are we talking about these two ones here or the, between yeah. the different orange boxes? Yeah, those, those uh, it's, it's uh, sounded like what you said was either the amygdala network or the HC network is figuring out which of the two MPFC networks should be used, so or at least uh, somehow so routing it, data. It's BLA network is deciding whether the um, hippocampal network or PFC network should be used. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the the two parts of the MPFC one is an upwards path and encoder, and the other one's uh, a decoder. The other one's an encoder. So it's 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 not like alternatives. Oh, I got it. Okay. No, got it. Thank you. And the, and the reason why they have um, these encoder and decoder parts, uh, which like, just like Kevin mentioned, is because um, ultimately this, uh, this, this approach boils down to replay, or it's, they refer to it as rehearsal a lot in the, in the actual review paper. Um, so replay, the idea is that uh, as, as, you're, as you're learning, you um, store previous examples in memory, and then you replay those so that uh, you, you retrain on those so that you're not entirely forgetting them. Uh, and there is additional memory cost to, uh, storing, uh, to storing those examples from the past. But then, as I see it, I'm not sure if this is a really continual learning, even though they make the case that it is, because this is data that um, you saw some number of tasks in the past, but you're seeing it again and still updating your parameters again on this. So in this case, what they're doing is pseudo replay, which is, I guess, a bit different in that in that you're not exactly storing examples in memory, but you you do have this um, um, sorry this 
this decoder network, which is able to sort of generate synthetic examples for your replay purposes. So, um, I guess, and then I think this is used, uh, this is part of, this is used especially in their um, sleep phase, as they call it, to consolidate knowledge between the hippocampal network and PFC network. So that um, covers the three main areas where they, of, of I guess, continual learning approaches um, so far. And now we can move to part two, um, which uh, I hope we'll able, be able to spend more time on and uh, have some discussions about. So uh, as, they, as they make the claim, the, these are the four general pillars for lifelong learning agents versus developmental and curriculum learning, um, transfer learning, curiosity and intrinsic motivation, and finally, multi-sensory multi learning. I'll talk about the first, uh, third, and fourth ones, and not so much the second one, because I didn't find anything in this um, in the review paper that was too insightful uh, about uh, transfer learning um, as it applies here. I'm a little confused by this, Akron. The four pillars, is this like generally agreed upon? This is, uh, this is from neuroscience, this is psychology, this is machine learning. I mean, who's, where, where did this list come from? <laughs> it's it's a it's a case they're making um, for okay. So they're saying these are these are like four attributes that lifelong learning has to have, or these are four four different approaches. I mean, we just went through three different approaches. Um, so now we have a list of four things. I'm, I'm just confused. Like, uh, so the three I just uh, mentioned are so if you take all the research that's been done today on continual learning in the especially in the neural network community. Um, how you can sort of categorize those into three different types of approaches. Okay, and I guess that was that was the main point of their paper to review. I, this I got that. So now I'm confused about this list. Then is this, this is this is this is making a case for um, what what ought to be done to create truly uh, to create agents that can um, learn throughout their lifetime. So these are four things that all these these are all requirements, or these are four ultimate requirements. These are these are four attributes we're looking for in life learning. Is that is that the right yeah. way of saying it? Yeah, I okay. think that's a better way of looking. Okay, it. they're saying okay, we don't know what the right answer here is yet, but these things have to be done. Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah, exactly. Wait, did they say set of requirements? Sorry, they um, arguing that you cut out for a second. Could you repeat that? So they are arguing it's necessary. Are they also arguing it's a sufficient set? No, they didn't say anything about sufficient, um, this being a sufficient requirement. Okay. So the first one is um, developmental and curriculum learning. Um, the reason why they think this is important is because you know, humans don't learn from um, examples of data in isolation in random order, which is mostly how neural networks now, right now are trained. And so, you know, taking inspiration, so they make a case for taking inspiration from how kids learn and also um, through having some sort of curriculum, which I, which has been shown in the past in, in neural networks to um, improve um, the speed at which a model learns. So the key idea here is that in infants, um, there's a critical learning period where uh, the brain is highly plastic and you can learn really fast. And then over time, it sort of slows down. I guess the neural network analog of, of this would be like a decaying learning rate. That would That would be like the simplest way of looking at it. Um, and, and in terms of curriculum learning, uh, I guess what, what people in the past have shown is that um, as the task get progressively harder, then uh, it, it, it'll speed up the rate at which the network learns as opposed to just having a random assortment of tasks. And, and finally, um, curriculums can change based on the learning progress. So and then this brings us to um, the third point, which we're going to talk about soon: um, curiosity and motivation. Because if it's not, it's not necessarily that there's only one dimension that you can look at a uh, at, 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 on which you can order a set of tasks and saying, okay, this is clearly the hardest, this is clearly the easiest, so we should do it this way. But rather, this, these curriculums can change based on how learning has progressed so far. That's a question. Um, curriculum to me kind of implies two things. Uh, formally, you're looking at uh, layered information where uh, you need uh, you need lay, lay down a foundation before the next one is comprehensible. The other thing is that uh, 
in in a baby there's accessibility there are certain things that can only uh, that can be learned at a certain age but nothing more complex and then once those are kind of mastered you go on to the next one so both of them imply kind of a structured approach to curriculum and i'm just wondering how the neural net community would try to organize things so that it it actually the curriculum actually is structured uh, i mean you can talk about simple to complex but there the, how, how do they draw those lines um so i'm not uh they didn't make any mention of how exactly they, they would do it in a continual learning setup but i would guess that um it would be um you, you have I guess task. This would sort of uh, carry over into transfer learning, where um, you have, if you have one set of tasks, if learning one task is believed to help in learning the next task, then maybe you'd learn the first task first. And and in the neural network community, um, it's uh, they they see curriculum learning as a sort of pre-training. So um, that means if you learn, uh, wait. Uh, yeah, so by pre-training, I mean like if you learn um, if you learn something that's I guess a, a little more general, and then if you have something that's more general and something that's some, somewhat more specific, then learning the first thing will speed up in learning the second thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Well, you, you kind of did. It's it's a question of I mean, philosophically, I can understand you know what they're they're uh, what they're uh, trying to accomplish here, you know, by uh, looking at uh, how uh, learning uh, happens in humans. The question is, how do you, how do you determine ahead of time that, you know, learning these tasks is critical to learning the next task, or you, you just kind of throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what works? So, so Kevin, uh, I, I think it's a very interesting question. And <clears throat> Usually curriculum learning in machine learning is seen as simple to complex, just because these networks, they don't have this notion of hierarchy, right? You're just, you have like one single output layer and you just soft max across the whole thing. So there's no notion of general versus specialized test. So it's more of a showing the easier examples first and then showing the more complex examples later. But I see your point that if you look at curriculum learning in a human learning point of view, then you have this notion of like hierarchy, learning like the general and then learning the specific. But that's that's not how I've usually seen in machine learning. Okay, I was I was kind of hoping that you could you could show a progressive uh, that that the the hierarchy becomes kind of embedded in the network hierarchy where certain the the precursors of certain tasks reside in some lower levels and then they get combined in upper levels and whether you're trying to drive that kind of uh, structure uh, onto the network. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe I'm just trying to take the uh, uh, over analogize that term. No, no, that's a, I think that's a very interesting point and something to think about. I mean, it, in, in, in to, to what Karan say, that's kind of like uh, putting formalism to transfer learning where uh, the, the lower levels get uh, uh, reinforced because they're continually useful for the upper levels. And at some point you decide uh, that's good enough or yeah, I don't need to learn, my learning rate doesn't need to be as high on those lower levels and I can start uh, uh, concentrating on the upper levels. And, and you know, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting analogies here, but I, I'm just ignorant as to how they might've been exploited already. I also want to point out that um, there was one uh, work that I think was done by Pierre-Yves Odoye, who is a, who is a um, RL who focuses mostly on reinforcement learning. And he, he had uh, some work uh, where the curriculum actually was determined um, through, they had, they, had, they had some sort of a policy where they were determining at each time what uh, next, learning which next task would improve uh i guess the overall overall lear learning and 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 so that's like you know that's combining i guess curiosity and some sort of motivation with curriculum learning um and, and i i don't recall exactly how they defined it but how they defined um what their what would be the best next 
uh, one to learn, but uh, there are probably many ways to do it. Okay. Yeah, I remember he, he gave a really nice talk at ICLR, ICLR a couple of years ago on, he's done, they've done a lot of uh, study of the psychology of this and then able to show it or translate some of that to deep learning. And was there had all these metrics, like how quick, you know, you're making predictions about how quickly you might learn and looking at how quickly you actually do learn and you want to go towards tasks that you don't really know currently very well, but you could actually learn so quickly and you could do that in a, uh, you know, completely unsupervised autonomous way. Okay, the next one is curiosity and intrinsic motivation, which we've already somewhat talking about. So um, the reason why this is, they picked this as one of the, one of the pillars is because um, right now, as, as we, as neural networks continually learn, they are, they are being shown one task after another, whereas they, um, the goal of a lifelong learning agent is to actually go out and, you know, be able to decide what they want to learn when. And so this idea of having some, some sort of, some heuristic for curiosity or motivation, this would be able to allow an agent to decide what it is that they would want to learn next, or what would it make sense to learn next? Um, and this, and that could be like to, for, uh, to minimize some sort of forgetting or, or, or whatever. Um, and let's see. So I think a lot of work uh, in, in this area, especially has been probably done mostly in reinforcement learning where um, in the cases where rewards are very sparse um, and in environments in general are, can be potentially sparse or noisy that you can add some sort of, you can add a heuristic for curiosity and that will help the agent go and uh, find, find, or that'll be some sort of additional signal for the agent. Um, I think Lucas, you, you mentioned to me once that there was this work where they, they define curiosity as like neck as like um, amount of error or something. And so the agent goes towards wh whatever they're really bad at to, to learn, to get better at it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the basic, basic idea uh, behind Deepak's work on curiosity based learning. So you have uh, two networks. One is learning a model of the word the transition function. The other is learning the policy, which action to take. And, and the reward for the policy is the negative of the loss in the model function. So it's always seeking, it's learning a policy that's always seeking the highest uh, error possible in the model. So it's, seeking a, it's taking actions that it's gonna take the agent towards a part of the world that doesn't know yet. That's kind of the idea behind it. And I think- um, Vivian, um, about it. Another key component, like building off what just Lucas said, is that it's not just it, like the error is a big part, but it's also like, it, there's like a prediction of what action will take you to the next state so that um, you'll only explore things that you have like con potential control over, uh, if that makes sense. So like, for example, if there's like random noise in the environment that leads to a lot of error, but you have no control over that as an agent. Whereas um, like if you can predict what action would actually result in that and use that as a training signal, then you actually go to things where there's a lot of error, but there's also a potential for your actions to influence the environment. Yeah, so it sounds like um, how curiosity is defined here really, really affects the outcome. And I'm not sure if there's really an, an agreed upon way, but uh, I feel like people are trying different things. Yeah, it, it, it sort of looked uh, to me as if the um, kind of a middle ground is that uh, if the agent looked for things that were seemingly accessible to it, in other words, you know, it kind of gets a somewhat good result, but not too bad. Maybe he'll work, work on that. Whereas something that you basically bounces off entirely, just gets no results whatsoever, might avoid that and try to get better at the things that it seemingly, you know, has some handle on and then return back to the other tasks later on. So you can kind of think of, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting there and, and, and learning how to plunk out a tune on, on, on some, uh, uh, some musical instrument, and you're not going to do. <clears throat> you're not going to jump from there and try to concerto, but you might, you know, pick similar tunes. And then after, you know, you know, I, I think there's the reward aspect of the curiosity is, you know, don't, you know, don't beat your head against a wall on something that is, you know, from after a first couple of trials, you're you're horrendous at. So, I, I think there's 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 interesting things to be learned from that. All right. Oops. 
And the, the final um, pillar that we'll talk about is multi-sensory learning. And the reason for what, the, the claim and why this is important is because um, agents generally operate in a really noisy world and um, this and cross and multi-century learning will allow them to generally be more robust to all the different sorts of inputs they're receiving, which are usually will probably contain lots of noise. Um, and it's useful for three reasons that they highlighted here. First one, um, it'll yield a mo more robust responses to the input. Um, this, 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 is, this sounded very hand wavy to me, but the way I made the way I, the way I interpreted this was that um, if you go back to the coffee cup example where you have your hand and the and the mug, then if I have one mug, if I have just one finger trying to, um, going over the mug, um, that will probably uh, I'll probably be able to figure out what what object I'm sensing and where on that object I am if I have say two fingers or a, or a whole hand. So that's not really multiple different sensory inputs coming in, but um, I guess you can expand that idea to um, to different modalities too. In, in some ways you can say it is different sensory uh, inputs. I know it technically it's not, but you can just think of it like, um, you know, brain tissue is brain tissue and it doesn't, any particular column doesn't know what its input actually represents. And so at one level you can say, yeah, the, the, the different fingers are different, different sensory organs and, and whether they have the exact same sensor devices on their tips doesn't matter that much, you know. Um, it's, not, it's not that important. It's more important that they're all moving and sensing something. Um, so I think you can actually argue that. I've so often I've thought about that is that, that really it's it, this it's a sort of an arbitrary distinction sometimes between the different sensory modalities. It's just sensors moving. Yeah. It's like more more inputs, even though it's like the it's same. More yeah. independent inputs, and yeah, I mean even like the retina is not one sensory organ, right? There are parts of the retina that, you know, this part. We get some some parts of the cortex get color, some parts don't. It's you know it's not it's not all one thing. No. Yeah. Uh, second reason for um, usefulness they claimed is because representations in one modality can be reconstructed from ones in the other. If you have a uh, if you have only one only have one input, if you only have inputs from one modality coming in. Uh, this reminded me a lot of um, all the times that I listen to audiobooks and you know when when I'm when I'm looking at something visually and listening to my audiobook. And then I go back again um, sometime later, say, then I'm, I have my eyes closed and I'm listening to the same part of the audiobook. It'll remind me of that, of what I was looking at before, because your, I guess my, my auditory and my visual input sort of gets um, uh, tied together in a sense. And so, and then that, in, that, in that sense, I'm sort of reconstructing what I saw because it's tied to what I was listening to at the same time. That seems and, more like our voting mechanism um, to me, right? You know, you've got, Different columns and different parts of the cortex, so they're voting. And if uh, if one part of the cortex says I, I'm sensing some object at this position, then the other, it, the voting basically tells the other guys, you know, you should be sensing it too, even if it's a different modality. Uh, what you don't need though is the the voting mechanism. Does you don't need to do the integration. <laughs> the voting sort of a, the voting in the thousand brains theory says you don't need to bring them all together. Um, you can, but you don't need to. Anyway, so the vote that our arrow labeled enhancement can really be more than just enhancement. It can, it's, it can be just low voting and then everybody's agreeing on the same thing. And finally, um, it's useful, multi-sensory learning is useful because it'll force agents to attend to relevant information. Um, and this, this is because, um, you know, if you have all these different uh, senses come, if you have all these different sort of uh, uh, senses coming in from these different modalities, ultimately you have to pick out uh, which ones are relevant for whatever whatever it is the agent is trying to do or whatever they're trying to um, pick apart. And so, um, and, and I think the implicit assumption here is that being able to attend to something, uh, being able to give your attention to one particular uh, set, set of inputs is important here to be able to um, model what you're seeing around you and make sense of it. And so that's why uh, having all these different inputs will for, sort of force an agent to do this, as opposed as opposed to like just paying attention to one set of inputs that's com that, that's coming in all of the time. Okay, so that does it for the few pillars that um, they advocate for. Um, and then this is my last slide, uh, and it's just something I guess to that that has made me think quite a bit, um, which is when when should forgetting really occur? So there's this case study that um, the review paper talks about where uh, they take a bunch of kids that were born in Korea and up until, uh, and 
sometime between the ages of about three to eight. Uh, you know, they, they were fully immersed in, um, know, up until the age of uh, roughly five years old, they were, uh, moved, they were adopted by families in France. So they moved from Korea to France and they had no more exposure to any uh, Korean language anymore. And it was just all French from there on. And so about, I think when these kids were maybe adolescents, um, this re uh, studies were done um, where they, they uh, tried to measure how responsive these, uh, um, or how well these uh, kids were able to identify uh, Korean, which they really didn't have any exposure to after first few years of their life. Um, and they found that there was no difference uh, in, their expo in their response to Korean as opposed to the, the re just regular uh, other, other kids who grew up in France their whole life. So uh, this shows that clearly there's, they forgot how to uh, speak Korean altogether. Um, now, you know, whereas, you know, if you have, uh, I guess in a lot of modern neural networks, you'll see if, if we forget um, task A after we learn task B, we'll, we'll say, okay, well, this is a problem. We shouldn't forget um, how to do task A, but are there, I've been thinking about, are there cases where we actually, it's okay to forget, or we would expect it to forget in this case, so. Um, That's an interesting question because uh, it might be might be essential that we forget to do continuous learning. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it, what it, it, it was earlier talked about adding additional resources, but uh, and there are some parts of the brain where that's happening. Where well, I wouldn't say additional resources, where resources are turning over. Like you get new cells, but presumably other ones are disappearing. And um, but if you think about the brain as sort of a fixed resource, like I can't, I can't double the number of double the number of neurons in my brain uh, throughout my lifetime. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, you can think it's you know once you reach adulthood, the number is pretty well fixed. Again, they can be changing, and, and some dying, some new ones coming in, but. Um, so if you have fixed resources, in some sense, you have to forget at some point, you know, and so it's how you forget and what, not just what you forget, but, you know, uh, as you learn new things, you slowly forget some other stuff. And we, that's part of normal life. We just don't remember the details of the things we used to do. You know, it's just, so it may be a, a essential property to forget, not just, mm -hmm. oh, it's not just an option. Yeah. Yeah. This way, like, also, just tons of stuff just in everyday life that we just don't remember yeah. even a few <laughs> days later. Yeah. And that exactly. may that may be actually required. Like, you know, when I was going into work, driving into work, I wouldn't remember where I had parked the car three days earlier. It's just not relevant. And, uh, and yeah, I'm sure my brain does not have the capacity to remember. Yeah. But even things. Stuff. Yeah. So there's stuff like that every day to day. Like as you said, like what did I have for breakfast two days ago? You know, probably can't tell me. But um. But there's other things like, you know, um, you know, the roads around the house where I grew up. Well, I knew those intimately when I was a child and a teenager and a young adult, but I would struggle with them now. I'd have a few of the basic things, but most of the details would be forgotten. And so that occurred slowly. It didn't occur all at once. It occurred over decades. You know, if I, between the time I was 20 and 30, I would have a pretty good memory, but got some things. And then between 20 and 40, I would have gotten more things. Between now, you know, 60, you would have got even more. So it's a sort of a gradual thing that happens for some yeah. memory. Yeah, so, sometimes you, but you have people who are, are not savants, but for whatever reason, they can remember what they had for breakfast every day since age five. Yeah, you I know? would say that. I would say that's a savant. Well, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's not a normal person, Kevin. <laughs> well, I know, but it's that just that one specific thing. But I, in the sense that they're not impaired in some other capacity. No, no. well, yeah, no, well, savants aren't always impaired. They tend to not generalize well. Um, so, but they do, they can remember huge amounts of data. Um, I, I, think, I think there's other explanations for that. I think it's basically saying they're taking the, what that tells me is that a human brain has this very, very large capacity uh, because there are savants who can re remember every word in every book they've ever, you know, every page of every book they've ever read, it's incredible. Um, but that's just the neural machinery can support that, but they're giving something up for that, right? So. They're giving up generally the ability to generalize and to see connections between things in the world. And um, so it just, it's not like we're wasting our memory and we're not using it all. We're just using it for different things. And so they have a, I, I don't know, it's an interesting question. I, I still, th I think all these, the, all those savants brains in our brain, normal people's brains, are all have sort of a fixed capacity. They're just using it differently. 
do you think for people with like photographic memory where it's not really a, like you think that's also a capacity thing or is it just like because that's more of like a different way of learning altogether I, right i'm saying the capacity in terms of neural architecture like the number of neurons and potential synapses is, is going to be roughly equivalent to these people right whether you're a savant or not um so savants have something different in arguably not as good, but maybe we could just argue, don't get into that argument. But there's something different about the structure of the brain to allow them to remember details. Uh, whereas we would remember, we would somehow be able to generalize some details. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say beyond that. We're on. Um, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to ask um, kind of what your opinion was on the distinction between sort of informational and uh, just general information and tasks and which um, if there's if there's an important distinction to be made about forgetting one or the other, um, because like in the, in this case with the, the Korean and French language, um, the, uh, it seems like the sort of overarching task is to communicate with other people. And so instead of forgetting, um, you know, how to draw their uh, or write their own name or how to paint or something, they forgot the uh, the means to communicate in a different language. So it's kind of like an intelligent way of like swapping out uh, specific task learning. Um, but yeah, so those are just a couple of points there. Yeah, I think um, that probably that probably is likely what happened here. In fact, in this paper um, where they did this study, they, they hypothesized that um, it was the same brain region, it was the, uh, the same brain regions that they would have been using for Korean that um, now became active for French. So it so it's like French totally overrode Korean here. Um, yeah, I was, I was wondering. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, apologies if I missed, but did they specifically address uh, kind of the importance of abstraction and kind of disentanglement? Um, because it, that seems to be kind of like a really important one um, for continual learning. And I was just wondering if they kind of discussed why maybe they uh, didn't include that as one of their sort of pillars. This idea of kind of like say on a reinforcement learning task, if you, rather than learning kind of a one-to-one -one mapping between pixels in an image, which you could get a, a perfect score, if you instead have a kind of disentangled notion of a hazard and the notions of uh, X, Y location, then you could much more uh, rapidly or you're kind of likely to be able to use that same kind of representation without overriding it to then learn on a new task. Um, um, they didn't make- And, 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 and that, that at least seems, I think there's some, yeah, literature that's been looking at kind of using disentanglement as a, as a way of improving um, continued learning. They didn't make any claim about disentanglement in particular, um, but see no they didn't really talk about representations or any of that um okay at all no but i guess um you mentioned you mentioned something about going from pixels to these representations right i guess that there's an implicit assumption there that um the input will always be pixelated or something like that yeah sorry i i guess what i more mean is um like there's this really good demonstration where um of what kind of often a reinforcement learning agent will learn where you can change every pixel in the uh, input image to um, uh, a different value. So it, it essentially to a human looks like uniform noise. So that say, for example, uh, a kind of hazard, like an object that if you jump on, you die in the top left will look nothing like one in the lower right. And a, and a typical reinforcement learning agent will learn this whole uh, problem just as well as if you use the original pixel input that the, the human learns on. But of course, a human learns much better on the, the original one because uh, you understand that these two things are related and, and you don't kind of essentially relearn for every pixel in the image uh, what the mapping of that is to, um, what, what the kind of significance of that pixel is. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, then the idea is if, if something was to build representations that, that do something a bit more similar to, to what we do then, um, then that would kind of save a lot of overriding of, of previously learned representations. I see. Um, no, in this case, they, there is no, there's no mention of that. And, and, yeah. Cool. 
in my next uh, one of the talks, if we get to it, um, it's an interesting, I think relates to what you were just saying, Niels, um, that some, you know, we have the ability sometimes to remember specific things, but we also generalize. We do both of those. And, um, and one of the ones that's always puzzled me is, is like with music, because I can, I learn a song, uh, I can generalize it very rapidly because I can hear it in any key and I recognize it immediately as the same song. Um, I can sing it back in any key. I never heard it before. So I've internal sort of an invariant property of the song. Yet I also tend to, people tend to know the actual key that it was, that they learned it in or the key that is, it was popularized by a particular group or singer. And um, so we have a sort of specific memory and a generalized memory at the same time. It always, always struck me as, I, I think I have an explanation for that right now. So I might get to that. I don't know if that relate. I think that relates to what you were just talking about. But there's a sort of generalized learning that has to occur. I'm going to talk about the displacement cells. All right, that's all for me. So I'll stop sharing. All right, uh, if we're up for it, we'll do a neuroscience talk. Um, I'm a little nervous about this uh, because um, it's, it's really uh, deep down <laughs> dirty stuff. And I'm not sure everyone is up on all these things that I'm going to talk about. I know a few of us have been thinking about these things for years. so. Um, um, and I'm also don't have anywhere near as nice presentation as Karan just did. I'm gonna, as I did last week, I'm gonna show pages from my notebook. <laughs> so um, uh, I have a feeling I'm really worried of losing a lot of people uh, just because of the poor presentation I'm about to do. But um, jump, tell me when you're confused or if you're lost, because um, I'll be glad to try to explain things. Um, let me just get going. I'm gonna share my screen. And unlike last week, I hit all my windows that show personal stuff. That's my email. Um, so hopefully it'll, it'll work differently this time. Does everyone see this uh, Word document? Yeah. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, the topics I'm gonna talk about. I, I just thought I'd clarify some terminology. Just, I was afraid people might get confused by this. Um, we've been, and I, the most guilty party perhaps of all, have been uh, talking about, when we talk about grid cells and head direction cells and play cells, those are all cells that are in the hippocampus or the entorhinal cortex, um, other you know, non-cortical areas. But we're talking about things in the cortex and we think there's these equivalent cells in the cortex. So I often will use, instead of grid cell, I'll call it like a location. And instead of a head direction cell, I'll call it orientation. And we've used these terms a lot. And I, unfortunately, in my personal writing, I go back and forth between these all the time. So when I, if I say location, I'm like a location cell, I mean a grid cell. If I say a location module, I mean it's the same as a grid cell module, but I'm talking about in the cortex. If I say an orientation cell or an orientation module, that's going to be the same as a head direction cell. So that's a bit of a nomenclature issue. Um, the three topics I want to go through today, I think I've been making very, very good progress on issues uh, related to. Um, you know, the cortical column in general and specifically um, representations of space and movement. Um, so I want to go over those. I'm going to start with a review of uh, this idea of, of 1D location cells versus 2D location cell modules. We, uh, we've been talking about that on and off. I just want to review some things about that. Uh, then I'm going to talk about displacement cells um, and displacement cell modules. And I, and I have a, a much better understanding, I think, how they work right now, which is great. And then I'll have some thoughts about, you know, orientation and location or determining orientation, determining location, head direction cells and grid cells are actually really just two flavors of the same thing. And, um, and then sort of map out all the possibilities. So I'll just, I'll just keep, keep going, but if anyone has questions, you should stop me. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of review of the, uh, the idea of um, uh, grid cell modules or location cell modules and the idea they have 1D and 2D ones. I'm just really jump first into, go back to our frameworks paper. I hope you can see the frameworks paper here. And in this paper, this came out two years ago, we talked about representing space um, uh, in the cortex or in the, in the around cortex, either one. And we had this idea that, oh, you've got these grid cell modules where your cell responds multiple places in the environment. So you don't really don't know where you are. And then you have another grid cell module that responds at different scale orientation. And there you can combine the two and you can say, well, now I know more specifically where I am by the intersection of them. 
So there's something I think we got fundamentally wrong about this and something we got fundamentally right. The thing we, I think we got fundamentally wrong is I think the brain never wants to operate in this mode where you have a cell responding in multiple places within a particular environment. Um, remember the grid cell modules exist at different scales. And O'Keefe, who's a discoverer of play cells, lamented he didn't discover grid cells because he said he wasn't using a big enough environment. When he first was, he was measuring from things we would now call grid cells, they only fired a second time when the animal would have been far outside of the box. It is a single grid cell only represented one space, one, only fired once. And only when you go down to a scale where a different scale, a smaller, do the same cell respond multiple places in the environment. And uh, as we, Marcus and we, we've been talking about, I've now moved to completely thinking that this is the mode that we never want to be in. That it's when we think about grid cells or location cells, we always want to be working in a module that has a scale where you're just not going to repeat. And, and, and a cell that would repeat like this would be better for a smaller environment or a smaller scale for working in something where it wouldn't be repeating, something that's in physically smaller space. Um, so that's, I think, what we got wrong. What we got right is the idea that multiple uh, modules uh, have this really magical property where you can, um, if you combine them, you can create very, very large spaces. But the modules that we're going to combine are not grid cells, these 2D grid cell modules. The modules we're going to combine are the 1D modules that are used to generate them. So we've been talking about that too. So I'll go back and review that right now. Um, so let's go back to my word file here. So, um, so the basic idea here is, it, and these are just like cartoon drawings. They're not really, they're, they're for my benefit. So please excuse that. There's lots of little quirks of how I drew these things. So here's a 2D grid cell module. You can think about, you know, the bunch of cells, each one responds to some location environment, another one responds to a different location environment, and so on. And it doesn't matter how the animal gets some location. When you get to a location environment, the cells bond, you go to another location, another cell respond. Um, but we think that now we have a, we've learned a lot about how these how grid cells come about. And the basic idea is they come about from 1D. Uh, motion sensitive velocity controlled oscillators. So what I've been proposing for quite a while now is that in the cortex, you have mini columns. These representing these pictures represent a layer of cells in one mini, a different mini column. Um, and each mini column, in, in, in each situation here represents movement in a particular direction. And, um, and these can be, I mean, they don't have to be orthogonal just as long as they cover the basis of the, of the space. And these can be observed, as I talked about. You remember that we talked about you can, you can from like from the retina, you can flow bits will tell you what are the movements of it. For instance, so these are observed. But what you've got here is a set of cells that uh, represent movement in one direction. A set of cells represent movement in a different direction. A set of cells represent movement in a different direction. And these are these are toruses, as as Marcus like to say. The, the the cells will as you move, each the individual cells have become active change. And they wrap around and they come again. Um, and um, the way they basically work is that there's a base theta, that's supposed to be a theta, not a G, uh, that's being supplied to all these guys. But there's an inherent frequency in each of these little columns, which is based on the, how fast it is moving in that direction. So that's a theta plus delta. And the, the delta is different for each of these mini columns because each one is moving in a different direction. So if I'm moving, if I'm moving north, then this guy might have some at some speed, my delta would be something. If this represents moving east, then it would be it would be not there'd be no delta, it wouldn't be moving at all. And so the, the, the progression of the changes here, um, uh, which cell is active, uh, depends on how fast it's moving. Um, and um, th these different cells are represent different phases of the theta cycle. So you can imagine a wave of activity that's that's traveling in, within one theta cycle. Where this guy is, is at its peak, uh, its peak um, depolarization. This one follows, and this one follows, and this one follows, and this one follows. And the active cell represents where the uh, which of the cells is at its peak at the same time as the base theta. Right. So this is not something we've made up. We've just, we've just, I've just pushed this. This, this idea is, is pretty clear. This has to happen. I'm, I've laid it out on the neuroanatomy of the cortex, um, and I think this. I present different ideas. I'm pretty sure this is the right one now. Um, so you can ask me, so well, what is this is a 1D module, right? This is a, a 1D module. You can say, well, what does it represent? Well, it's, you could say that uh, it represents a location in the room when the animal is moving in a particular direction. So this cell will become active 
when the animal is moving in a particular direction at a location in the room. If it's at, 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 it won't become active if the animal is moving in a orthogonal direction. Um, uh, so it's it's sort of a combination of a bit of it. It's, a, it's an orientated and location. It's partly gritty and partly orientation. We'll and if, if the animal moves the opposite direction, does it? Does there's, an, there's another there's another uh, column of the active. So, so does are, does the the one does the first column move backwards or does it just no, not? No, no, it doesn't move backwards. So okay. the, the, we, and I base that on the idea that if you look at the cortex, you look at the responses of the mini columns. There's you know one that moves you know you could say let's like, say moving left, and there's a different one that moves right. And um and, and when the one that's active moving left, the other one moving right doesn't become less active. It doesn't become negative active. It just is inactive. So we're working on that assumption. I've been I've been assuming that all along that that these are these are truly one directional vectors, and, that, and if I wanted to cover two direct two you know moving forward and backwards, I'd have to have two of them. Uh, and um, uh, I think everything else here. We, uh, uh, before I get off this page, one of the things we know has to happen with <clears throat> with grid cells or location cells is they have to anchor, meaning. Um, they have to, when you enter an environment, you recognize that you say, oh, I have to anchor which cells are active. We've talked about anchoring the grid cells. And then even just last week, I talked about perhaps, I thought I showed a mechanism about how that might happen. I don't think that's likely. I think the anchoring is gonna occur here. That, and what it means is that somehow there's a sensory input um, and I'm not gonna go, I have some ideas about it, I'm not gonna go into it today, but there's a sensory input that comes in which says, oh, I know, or I recognize the sensory input. Well, I'm going to decide which cell is at its peak right at the same time as which cell which is the base theta. So basically, what anchoring means is just, just picking which of these cells is, is currently at its um, its peak frequency to match the theta, and and that's sort of like saying that's my location, and I'll start moving from there. So every every uh, column that's got activity would be doing that. Okay. So um, the, the way you've written this, I'd, I'd, maybe you have an answer coming up to this, but if you only have, um, if, if say, say this is tracking the location of my finger, I lift my finger up, one of my, one of my rings updates in response to that, maybe multiple, I move my finger back to a starting position, a different set of rings update, so I lost the path integration property because it's a, I've, I've landed at a different representation. Well, you've lost the path integration property here. Uh, uh, these 1D modules. I'm not yeah. sure you've lost it down here at the 2D module stage. Okay. Um, so it's an interesting question why you have 2D modules and 1D modules. And I, I have partial, I have partial the answer to that, but I, I haven't spent a lot of time on it. So again, you wouldn't have lost it here. And I don't know the interaction between these. I guess last week I presented how these mini columns could, could drive the, the 2D cells. I did not present any ideas about how the 2D cells might go back and do these guys. And the other thing that's going on is yeah, because that's the general answer to that question. Um, with vision, you know, you, you're, be, you're going to be constantly getting sensory input as you move either forward or backwards. With your finger, you won't, right? With your finger, you'll get, you won't get any sensory input. You'll get maybe proprioceptive input saying, oh, you're moving your finger up and moving your finger down. But there'll be no sensory data to, to re-anchor these cells. So when you start moving back down, um, if you're going to do path integration, it's going to have to these guys are going to somehow have to re, re innovate the right ones here. And I have no, I don't have a proposal for that. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this basic thing is what's happening. And I, I felt very strongly about the 1D thing for a long time. And it just, the more and more I get into it, uh, and today you'll see there's some more things which is recommend, recommended. Okay, so um, that's a review of that idea. And this is just a reminder, this is the picture I showed. Um, last week how a grid cell, this is a 2D grid cell, would be intersecting with a bunch of um, mini columns nearby to update itself. I'm not gonna go into that again, that was last week. Now I wanna talk about displacement cells. Um, and let me go back to the framework paper review of these displacement cells. Uh, so um, here we go. And um, displacement cells came about from this problem, the cup with the logo problem. And it, I mean, we just use that as an example. Where is when we really think about composition of objects, it's not some feature at some location. It's really other objects at some relative pose or relative location and orientation. So if I want to learn this coffee cup, I don't relearn 
all the details of the mental logo and say, oh, I'm going to learn there's an A on the coffee cup here and a T on there. I just say, no, there's a mental logo. And somehow instantly I can associate the entire logo with the entire cup. And all that knowledge is, is done. And um, so that's a really challenging problem. And I, I don't know who uh, came up with the idea, but I know that it was uh, Marcus Ua and Scott when they came in and presented it at a, at a recent reference uh, research meeting. And they proposed part of the solution. And part of the solution was this idea of, of a way of saying, um, okay, we have a way of determining uh, the relative displacement between um, uh, a grid mod, a grid cell module in the coffee cup and a grid cell module on the loco, so that we can we can go from one location to another location. So given the location of the cup, I can tell you the location on the on the logo. Um, I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but I think I think that general idea was really really right. And again, we made the same mistake we made with grid cells. We assumed that the displacements were going to be calculated in the 2D um, grid cells, um, which it's not. I think it's going to be calculated in the 1D uh, displacement model. And, um, but the idea that the other, but the other really big idea, which is still holding is that there'd be multiple displacement modules, one for each grid, each grid module, grid module, grid module. And when you combine each displacement module, it doesn't tell you too much, but you combine them, you get this, you, what you end up with is a unique representation for the logo on the coffee cup. So that was really cool. There were several other things that were, that didn't work here. And we pointed them out in this paper. One of them was that, um, this didn't deal with orientation. There's no way of translating, you know, what if, it, what if the logo is in an angle on the cup? We couldn't handle that. Uh, there, was, there was no mechanism for it. And the other one was scale. The, the logo has a certain size. I could have a small logo, a big scale logo. So it, it, it only handled one part of the issue, um, which is, but it was, it was the right idea, I think. Uh, we also made the, the observation in this paper that the displacement concept, the displacement module is not only what you use to represent where the lo logo is on, on the cup, but it is also be the, the correct representation for movement, like how an animal should move to achieve, achieve a result. And the basic idea here is imagine there's a, there's a, there's a reference frame, a grid cell anchoring of the cup, and there's another reference frame, a grid cell anchoring for the logo. If I find the displacement between a point on the cup and the point on the logo, that tells me the relative position of the cup in the logo. However, if I just take two points on the cup and I find their displacement, I use the same basic mechanism in the same reference frame, then it represents a distance on the cup. And basically it represents you know, how I'd have to move to get from one location to the other. We talked about this little picture here showing how multiple modules result in a unique representation. And then I put this equation in the, uh, where is that equation? Uh, Oh, um, uh, it's a, like a little, there's two little equations I have here. Uh, I thought I had it. I, it, it was I there for a second. Oh, I missed um, it. Did it up higher, through? I think. Yeah. Know this paper better, huh? Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, the, the part of the show. Um, I pointed out that um, there's this sort of back and forth between grid cells and displacement cells. So this is, this is the idea here that if I, if I have a location in one reference frame plus a displacement, I would now get the same, what the correct location is the second reference frame. Um, but if I had two locations in the same, um, you know, if I start with two locations and I subtract them, I get a displacement. So it's just like this going back and forth and then, um, I'm sorry, I guess it wasn't ripple control that. <laughs> but then we, then we did one step further. We realized that um, if I took two components of an object like a stapler uh, in this case, and we said, well, there's a displacement between the top part and the bottom part. As that part moves, that top part moves, you go through a series of displacements. Um, and if you can learn that series as a sequence, then you would learn the behavior of this object, how the stapler would open or how it would close, how things move relative to each other. So displacement tells you where things are relative to each other. And then a sequence of them would tell you how those things move relative to each other. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, we came to the realization that all representations of, of objects in the world, we never store a feature at a location. We're always just storing displacement. So a bicycle, is I don't have a picture of a bicycle. A bicycle is a bunch of other objects 
all at some relative displacement to each other. And, um, and uh, each of those objects, like a wheel or a pedal or a seat, is composed of other objects that are all relative locations. So, so the entire model of the world is basically objects at relative locations to objects, which is relative locations to objects in sort of hierarchical fashion. All right, so that was a review of what we wrote about there. And I think what, I, what I'm gonna argue now is, um, uh, I'm gonna argue, first of all, that if I have 1D grid cell modules, which I think we do, um, then I'm going to have 1D displacement cell modules because I only have to figure out the displacement in one dimension. I don't have to display displacement in two dimensions. Now, let's just think what a displacement is. I'm just going to verbally walk you through this. What a displacement means, if I have a displacement cell, what should it respond to? It, it, it's going to say, well, if I move a certain amount in the, in the location module, let's say I move from one cell down to another cell, that is a, a displacement, but I want the cell to respond when I do it from this cell to this cell or from the next cell down to the next cell down, the next cell down to the next cell down. So it's, it's just saying like, it's a movement of three. It doesn't matter where you're starting from or movement of five. It's, it's, it's like you're moving a certain amount in this direction, but I want the cell to respond regardless. It doesn't matter where you start from. It's a displacement, the delta, you know, the, um, that we're trying to calculate. And it was very, it was always difficult for me to figure out how a displacement module could could learn that. How could a cell learn to represent this cell to this cell and this cell to this cell? It's like a big, you know, complicated OR function, right? Um, and, and then I had this idea this last week that, that it's actually easy for the displacement cell to be calculated and we didn't think about it right. So I'm gonna have to just try to walk you through this here. Um, let's, um, here's, for a moment, Let's pretend this is a 1D location cell, right? So a module, it's not a displacement, it's not a displacement module, it's a grid module. And, and so when we come in and we have some environmental input, I pick the active cell, right? Or some active cell. And then at that point, when I start to move, I start moving the, you know, as I move the active cell, the, the bursting cell changes and slowly as it progresses. Now, let's say I had the, the exact same thing exact same setup like this, same cells, same number of cells, same, you know, they're all moving based on movement. But instead of anchoring to some sensory input, I, at the beginning of movement, I anchor to one cell, let's say the top cell. I say, I'm gonna just anchor to that top cell when I start to move in this direction. And now the cells are gonna start moving slowly down as I move. Now, when I stop moving, it's gonna be at some location here. That is how far I've gone. Um, and that's my displacement. That'll that cell will represent, uh, doesn't matter, it'll represent the, how far the cell in the grid cell module moves because it's, this is just directly recording the, the, amount, of, the amount that I've moved. <laughs> so it, it's a very, very simple idea, but I think it works. I've been spending a lot of time on it. If I have a displacement cell on the grid cell module, I have a displacement cell module or the grid cell module and the grid cell module, they're, they're very identical. One just anchors on the sensory driven input to say, where I am, where am I in this space? And the other one says, I'm gonna anchor at the start to tell you how far you've gone as you move in this space. And every time you start to move again, you have to re-anchor again. Um, uh, this guy is not, uh, it's not doing path integration in any sense, you know, it, it, I don't know. It, it's basically just sort of measuring how far you've gone from the start of a movement to the end of a movement. And of course, that's going to be constrained to the size of the environment because I've already picked my grid cell modules to say that all my grid cells will be inside of this. You know, a, a, a particular grid cell will only fire once inside of this space. Um, so um, that's the basic idea. Let's see if I had any notes I want to write about there. I said, originally thought we'd start with grid cells. But that's hard to do. I should mention that. Let's plug into this stuff here. Um, I think I've said all this. Um, um, yeah, okay, I've said all that. So um, the next thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this all together in a moment now. The other thing I, I just wanna talk about is a little bit about orientation cells. Uh, I've mentioned this in the past, I'm gonna mention it again now. You know, orientation cells basically, it's like you're moving and as you move, your orientation changes. You can think of it like a head direction cell, but again, um, this could be in any, any uh, if it's a three-dimensional world, I have a three, three, I need at least three variables to represent my orientation that I'm facing. And, um, 
And so it's just a different type of movement. Instead of moving, you know, instead of moving through space uh, in, in, from, from one location to the other, I'm just changing my, my direction of gaze or my orientation of my fingers or something like that. And, and we have to do all the same things with orientation cells we have to do with grid cells, meaning I have to do path integration. I have to be able to say like, well, if I were to turn so many degrees to the left, what would be my new orientation? I have to do anchoring. Basically, when you come into a new environment, you have your 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 head direction cells have to anchor based on sensory input, and and so we and 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 it's because we're doing this uh, path integration, we're going to have a bunch of modules just like we had before. So I'm going to argue here that orientation is going to be basically the exact same thing that's going on with with uh, location. Um, it's just that the if I think about the 1D modules, imagine these modules now representing orientation. What's driving these is not moving forward or backwards in a particular direction, but turning left and right in a particular direction, if you will. And everything else uh, stays the same. There's, there's almost no difference. If you put this all together, um, yeah, let's get that. So what are we talking about so far? Well, you can group this in two basic groupings here. There's orientation and there's location. And I'm not certain it has to be this well separated, but I'm gonna go with it for now. I think it's probably right. And so what might I have? Well, let's just talk about the location first, right? I'm gonna have, um, uh, I, I'm gonna have a bunch, I'm gonna have in a particular column, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have one 2D location module. So I'm gonna have one, what we would call a grid cell module. I'm gonna have a bunch of 1D location uh, modules that are actually uh, driving these guys. And these are, these are the, the mini columns, a particular layer. This would be a particular layer in the mini column. And so uh, that's the 1D modules that are, actually, that are oscillating and, and um, interacting with the space data, which then drive this guy, as I talked about before. I'm gonna have a set of 1D displacement modules. Um, and because um, I need those to calculate my displacements. And I don't know if I need to have a 2D displacement module. It's not clear that I need that. I might need that, but it's not clear I need that. And so I, mean, I put a question mark here, but I definitely gonna, in my, in my mini column, I'm gonna have some columns that are being driven by this. These are all, these, this layer cells and this layer cells are all being driven by the same motion in some direction. And I'm, I'm going to be doing path integration over them, and I'm going to end up with my grid cell module. I'm going to have the same thing going on with orientation, um, and um, I am going to have a I'm going to have a, a, a set of orientation cells which we can consider like a two it's it's two D in the in the sense that it'll look like two D. It, it's a, it, I'm just, I shouldn't even say two D. Um, that's a misnomer here. It, I, I it's it's just a I have a set of cells. Let me go back to what I said down here about the, the 2D grid cell module. What, what the, the distinction here is that the cell here, you see, I'm talking about this little thing. This is our classic grid cell module. A cell here fires at some location in an environment. And it doesn't matter which way you're facing. It doesn't matter which way you're moving. Um, it, it, it'll precess depending on which way you're moving. But it, it, it basically represents some location in an environment. Um, and that could be a 3D environment. It could be a 2D environment. It could be a 1D environment. It, 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 when I said 2D here, it was a 2D layer sheet of cells. Um, but this is not restricted to dimensions. These are restricted to one dimension, but these are not restricted to two dimensions. And the same thing here. I have a bunch of one dimension orientation movement uh, column cells. Uh, this would be a layer of cells. And then I'm going to calculate a, uh, my classic head direction cell or, uh, would be one of these cells. Which it says, yes, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to, no matter where I am, um, I'm going to be, you know, facing, I'm facing this direction. I should, I should also, again, remind us that if I look at the activity of cells in a grid cell in these 1D modules, if I look at which cells are active in the 1D modules and I add them all up, it's, it, it, it's going to be unique to the environment. It's a unique representation. So we still have our large spaces. Um, uh, and the, if I add up all the displacement cells, it'll be unique per two unique objects. And same thing happens here. Interesting, if I look at the active 1D orientation cells, in the, if I look at all of them across all the different mod, many, the 1D modules, that would represent a location in a unique environment. I would say I'm facing north in this particular environment, where down here I'm saying I'm just facing north. Um, 
So we have this ability to go between um, a unique environment and non-unique environments in both cases. Again, it's not clear to me that we need a, two, a displacement module equivalent, um, but, I, uh, but I'm gonna need an orientation displacement module. Uh, these 1D ones, because I need to represent the lobe at a particular orientation on the cup. Um, and I can do that on a mini, on a 1D by 1D basis in some sense. So in the end, what I, what I know we're gonna need in a cortical column, we're gonna need, um, uh, we're gonna need two sort of uh, voltage control oscillating 1D mini column representations, one for, one for uh, a, a motion in a particular direction and one for the displacement in that direction. I'm gonna need a grid cell. We know we have these 2D grid cell modules. So we're gonna we're gonna have one of those. I'm gonna have the equivalent here. I'm gonna have two sets of layers that are assigned, one for assigned for movement in a uh, changing in orientation and one that's a displacement in orientation. And, and I'm gonna to have to have, if I have a classic head direction cell, uh, I'm gonna need one of these modules here. Um, by the way, when I talked about the thalamus a couple of weeks ago and how um, the thalamus is, is doing, um, um, you know, chain, in basically doing reference frame transformation. This is the cell that we're projecting the thalamus. This cell, these cells here say, um, what is my, you know, my, my current orientation uh, of, of, uh, of one object to another object or anything like that, or from my, from my current movement to the object I'm observing. So anyway, so um, at a minimum, I think each, each quarter of a column has to have, um, uh, each mini column has to have two or four, there have to well, there has to be these all these different components. I'm not sure about this one. Not sure about this one. Um, it's interesting that um, the orientation movements and the location movements are not the same. So it doesn't necessarily, you know, there isn't one mini column which just uh, spans all of these. And if you recall, in the past, I, I've shown pictures. Maybe I have one right here. Um, no, I don't have it here. Uh, I've shown pictures of. Um, uh, the upper layers of the cortex and the lower layers of the cortex. We know that there's at least two part, two layers in the cortex that are detecting movement. The lower layer three complex cells and the lower layer five complex cells. And so th this may be what's going on in sub the, the lower layers. Um, and this may be what's going on in the upper layers. Uh, so just because I have, I might go down to a mini column doesn't mean that all the cells in the mini column are representing the same thing. Um, one could be changing in orientation, one could be changing in forward direction and back, or there could be uh, there could be another range. I don't really know yet about that. So um, I want to point out one more thing about sequences. Um, you know, uh, these one D one D modules are ideal for learning sequences. They are they are the foundation of our temporal pooler. So if I have a series of one D um, displacement modules like I've shown here, or one D displacement modules I've shown here. Uh, if I want to learn a sequence of behaviors like the stapler opening up and the stapler closing, um, I basically just have to take these cells and apply our temporal pooler to our temporal memory to it. These, these are basically very you know, sparsely activated mini columns. Not all the mini columns have activity on them. There'll be only some of the mini columns in the cortical column in this layer would be active. You know? uh, but so it's, it's just exactly what our, our, um, our, temporal, our, our temporal memory does. So we we're really we're beautifully set up to take existing stuff we've already had to learn um, uh, the behaviors of objects here, if I'm doing that, um, or to learn the, my behaviors as I move through the world by, by sort of learning sequences here, right? If I learn how this is, this is actual movement through the space, this is uh, um, displacement modules are now, um, excuse me, uh, I said that incorrectly. Um, um, the displacement modules are the movement or remember the displacement modules are movements or displacement modules can learn um, behaviors of objects. So anyway, my point is we now have, I, I, the, the trick I thought of, which is just re-anchoring the displacement cells at the beginning of movements gives me my, um, it was a very simple way of calculating displacement. And now we have, and by going to 1D modules like this, it's very simple to learn sequences of them. Um, so we've already done all that. So that, that was a little note there from, and I then- I um, have a yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so if basically the 1D modules are responding to motion in a particular direction, uh, 
how many of them do you think you need to have sufficiency to actually cover the direction, the, the fineness of directions you need? Well, that's a good question. Um, we can just do some, uh, you know, back of the envelope type of calculations. If you think about a cortical column, I think the smallest cortical column I can imagine would have 100 mini columns. So that would be like, let's say it's, um, I don't know, uh, 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 well, I, pick, I can pick any number here, I'm making that my half. Let's say 400 microns by 400 microns for a mini column, and let's say each, each um, I mean, for, for a big column, and let's say there was uh, um, uh, 40 microns for each uh, mini column, so it'd be 10 by 10. So you might have a, you know, I think that's a good, that's a, 100 is sort of a, a good lower limit for the number of mini columns you might have. Is uh, 500 or even 1,000 would be a good upper limit. So we have that range to work from. Um, and, um, and so uh, I'm going to, you know, if I, if I, I, I don't know how to divide it up, Kevin, but there, there, at, at any point in time, I mean, so, so you might have, you might have 100 of these things to work from. Um, it may be not that big, I don't know, but now they're not all going to be accurate ones. But the point is that you could, you'll have a lot of, if you just put this through a spatial cooler, like, like I talked about in the past, you put the, the flow bits into a spatial cooler, you'll end up dividing this up into n number of mini columns. And if I, I might have a hundred dimensions I can work with. Um, and, um, and that's certainly well more than I possibly could use or need. Um, so I'm not saying you're gonna use all them, but it, there's plenty. And so you, you know, ideally, if I'm representing 3D space, I'm gonna do 3D, Three, three of these things, but they're going to—they're going to be overcomplete. There's going to be quite a lot of them, and they're all going to be different, right? They're all going to be slightly at different angles to each other. Uh, so, um, and that'll cover a lot of the noise in the system and, and make it much more robust and accurate uh, than otherwise. So, I don't know how many you need. Uh, technically, uh, mathematically, you don't only need three to represent a three-dimensional space, and you only need three to represent orientation. But we will probably have dozens, if not hundreds, of them. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that there are there are experiments in other directions in, in looking at orientations, such like how many, <clears throat> how much, what degree of overlap do you need uh, between these things to kind of make it clean? And but if you're saying that they're just kind of randomly oriented, but we'll we'll deduce a direction via space of pooler somehow, then they're not well, they're not oriented. randomly oriented. They're going to be learned. You're going to take these flow bits and you're going to put them through a, temp, a spatial cooler, and so it'll learn to divide up. The, 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 the trick about this thing is the column doesn't know what it's what it's representing. It doesn't know what its sensor represents, and it doesn't know what movement it's going to experience in the world. So it just observes the movements of the flow bits, as I've talked about before, and it's going to say, "I'm going to divide those up into a bunch of different, um, a, a bunch of different, you know, representations, just like the spatial cooler does." And um, so it's not like randomly chosen. They're going to be learned. If my sensor never moved in the third dimension, um, I would never represent the third dimension. You know, it wouldn't be there. If my sensor moves in four dimensions, well, I'll represent four dimensions. Um, so, uh, and, so and, and, and even it's here's another weird one theory. I'm not sure that these always have to be straight movements. It's like, you know, I think of like a rat moving forward straightly, but you know, as Marcus talked about, these grid cells get really kind of distorted in a bunch of places. So I technically all we can say is that it's these flow bits are coming in and the the the, the column doesn't know what they what they mean, but it just divides them up into like a, a nice um, set that it can work with. And so you know, movements could involve, you know, weird things too. I mean, they could be curvy movements that are also changing orientation at the same time. I, I'm not sure, it, it's a little confusing to me still. But the easiest to think about it right now is that the location 1D modules are all sort of straight line trajectories in different directions. And the orientation ones are similarly uh, changes in, in, you know, uh, changes in orientation, 1D orientation changes in all these different planes you, you're changing, um, you know, so. I, it, it, I need three, like I could look up and down, like left to right, and I can rotate uh, along the axis of my vision. That's me, I need to do orientation, but I could look up to 40 degrees and up to the right at 30 degrees. And also we have to, oh, I, should, I should point out as Marcus mentioned earlier, if I have three dimensions, I actually need six of these modules because I have to represent both directions at the same time. So three dimensions requires six. Um, so I, was, I misstated myself there. Um, uh, but we, we might have a hundred to work with. Oh, or 200 or 400. So um, a lot of stuff going on.
Okay. Yeah. Um, there's some, uh, you know, I can I just talk briefly here. Um, I remember I mentioned on the orientation cells, these are head direction cells. They are not specific to uh, uh, an environment. A particular orientation head direction cell says, I'm moving at this direction in this environment, but I'm, that cell could represent a different direction in a different environment. So it doesn't tell me what an environment it is, but these guys do, these 1D cells, if I look at them, they could collect on them. But what's interesting, what I need to compensate the, uh, for orientation changes the, the, in the transform I've talked about in the thalamus is these guys. I want to send a signal to the thalamus that says, you need to convert this input based on some orientation. I'm not going to review that again today, but we we'll talked about that. Um, but I want to tell this, I don't want to tell the thalamus, oh, I'm in room A, and you change, you need to change your orientation. I can just say, it doesn't matter what room I'm in, you need to change your orientation to match. So that's why you need these guys. That's why, you, you know, you need these head direction cells because that's what you need to send to the thalamus. Um, I'd, say, I'd say almost all the cells you have shown here need those cells. The, the 2D orientation model as labeled, uh, everyone in order to path integrate correctly needs to know that. Okay, I wouldn't, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm, uh, so in, including the 1D orientation modules. Well, uh, why, why do they need that to know once they, why do they, why do they need to know uh, the, uh, the 2D module? Uh, because other than, other than your finger example, right? You gave the finger example, I lift my finger up and then. Sure, he, here I'm talking about like the picture of a rat uh, rotating, like me and me and my chair right now, like this kind of rotation. Yeah. Uh, the, the way that those have to update is different based on if the if it's on a flat surface or a tilted surface. Yeah, but 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 I I am assuming that the transform of the thalamus is occurring constantly, and and so as I change my orientation, the input from the thalamus is being swapped at the same time. Um, and I haven't worked it through in detail, but I worked it through enough to convince myself I think I think it'll work. That uh, that that it's so yeah. So I said it. I can say it again. But I think that I think that obviates the need you just said. Um, as as the orientation is changing, as you start to move, the thalamus is constantly saying, "Okay, I'll move with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna rotate things for you." So. Um, uh, I haven't I haven't proven that yet, Marcus. But I, I guess the the second example I would use is if you're pointing a camera at a coffee cup, and then yeah. you 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 turn the camera to the right. What yeah. way do all of these one D orientation modules have to update? Uh, in order each to, one, well, well, okay. Uh, in order some, to solve that, I think they need to each know the three D orientation, which is well, I, they can observe it. Let's, let's say I have a camera, and they can observe the flow bits, right? Um, and I'm turning it to the right. So um, there will be a set of modules here, uh, up, well, actually here, these, these are the 1D orientation modules. There'll be a set of, now maybe this middle column here represents movement to the right. So that one, that one updates at maximal frequency, right? This one maybe is representing movement. Um, uh, so yeah, I was talking more about path integration. You're talking about taking the sensory input and figuring out how to update it. So it's yeah, like, well, um, it's if, if I have sensory input, that I'm, I can I can do everything, right? I think you brought up an interesting question earlier. If I don't have sensory input, it's a, it's a challenge. But if I have a sensory input, which in a, in a vision system, let's assume I always have that for the moment, um, then the visual input will tell me how each of these modules should be updated. I don't need anything else uh, to do that. Um, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not saying that there isn't a need, like you said, with the finger. If I lift it off, I have no sensory input telling me how the finger is moving. I just, I, 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 have, I might have, I have proprioceptive input, perhaps. Um, so I, I think those are some interesting open, open questions. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think it's not as obvious, to me at least, it's not as obvious that the need for, um, that, that you need to have this to represent the path integration here. Um, if you've got your sensory data, um, or, or you have um, an efferent copy motor command, uh, which I didn't talk about, but I also think it exists, which serves the same purpose as the sensory data. Um, then um, I think it could update, but you, know, you might be right. I, I'd like to, if you, if you could make the, oh, make the argument, convince me, I, I think that would be good. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go that far yet. I'm just, I'm just sort of laying things out. But to me, the big, the big, it's just getting closer to figuring out, okay, what are all the components that we have to be doing here 
how might they actually be working? And, um, and then to me, the big extra thing was the displacement module was like, oh, I got a whole way of doing the displacement module, which is simple because I, I remember when you presented the original displacement model concept, I really had struggling with it at first and um, understanding it. And then I said to myself, oh, you know, how is a cell gonna learn this? How can a cell learn to respond to all these, you know, crazy combinations of other cells? And now I realize you don't have to do that at all. You just have to do path integration, just like the, the other guy. So that was, to me, it was a big, a big plus for me this week. Um, and, that, and, that could, and now that I can do sequences as well, it tells me this is, this is almost certainly, this is, I'm very, very confident the basic things I just talked about are happening. Um, but lots of details I don't, I don't understand. So that's good. Yeah. I don't want to, more questions, more challenges, please. Well, for, first of all, if you have more, you're going to present. Uh, I should no, I finish. don't. I don't really. I just, I had a couple. I just, there's some. There's some things you could predict from this. I, I don't need to go through that. Um, oh, well, I, I. This is just. I guess things in my notebook. Here, here's one more thing. Just to remind ourselves that phase procession is going on here everywhere. <laughs> so, um, so in the one D columns and the two D modules, the there's actually not just one cell that's active, but at different parts of the theta phase, different cells are active. And so you're, you're, you're sort of running through little sequences, little subsets of sequences constantly in these guys as you're moving based on the phase procession. I just put that in there, so I don't want to forget that. <laughs> so that's another thing we have to accommodate. All right, I, I'm done. You can, you can go ahead. So one part that I just didn't totally follow is how the, um, how the displacement modules, either, either set of them, um, d does each, each cell in a displacement module uh have to learn dip pairs of location no, module no, cells not at all they don't so have to learn anything I, I didn't quite get how that how that mapping works without a set of learned pairs okay the only way i know to do it is about a set of learned yeah, pairs so the pairs. trick was i i say the, i'll say the trick again and i'll try to walk you through it the trick again is that the difference between let's say the difference between a displacement module and location and a displacement uh, and a location module right between a, a grid cell module and a displacement module is they're almost identical. It's about what they anchor on. So when you enter an environment, the grid module or grid cell module or these one grid cell modules will anchor on a particular cell. And, um, and that's happening over and over again, right? As, you know, you're, constantly up, you're constantly using sensory data uh, to, to, to re-anchor. Uh, but the ideal, ideally would, once you've got an anchor there and you start moving, that cell just keeps going and, you, and you're moving. Um, here, when, the, it's the same thing, but what you anchor every time you start the movement, every time you start moving, this cell anchors, and it always anchors on the same cell. Let's pick the top one, if you will. And, um, and that's the difference between them. Now, um, so this one's anchoring every time you get to the you start a movement. This is re-anchoring based on centering data all the time. And I don't even know how that happens, but it's going to happen. Um, so what, what occurred to me, maybe this will help your monkeys. What occurred to me, I was thinking about a, a grid cell module and I'm thinking like, okay. Um, and then I was thinking about a displacement cell module. And I said, well, what, 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 what if I, how would the displacement modules cells change as I move? Well, as I move between, you know, as I'm, what would happen is as I move um, relative to two points in the world that the active cell in the displacement module would change slowly uh, just like the active cell in the grid cell module. That is, my displacement changes as I move through the world. If, I, if I'm trying to say, what's my displacement between point A and point B? Um, I say, well, um, that cell will be changing slowly, just like this cell. They'll be moving at the same speed, actually. And so then I just realized, well, the distance it traveled here is your displacement. And so here I'm trying to say, oh yeah, the distance on the, on the grid cell module, the, dis the distance traveled could be between this cell and this cell, or it could be between another cell and another cell and this cell and another cell. But here it's just from the beginning to the end. And so the cell that I end up on after I start at the top and I move down, the cell that I end up on is the distance I've traveled. It doesn't matter where I was in the world, it's just the distance I've traveled and that's my displacement. Um, you know, remember, displacement cells represent movement between two points, or they represent, you know, it, the, the equivalent is the displacement between two points in two different grid cells, or two different reference frames. So it's the same thing. So essentially, just all you have to do is just track how far you moved in this direction from when you left point A until you get to point B, and, and the cell that is active is represents any 
that cell will represent any combination of points down here that move the same distance. Does and for help? and for object composition type displacements, do you use something similar where you just assume continuous like smooth motion? I think it's the same. I haven't worked it out completely. I think it's the same module. Remember going back to um, in our in our in our uh, uh, frameworks paper. Um, in the frameworks paper, we talked about this somewhere here. Um, we talked about uh, in in here. We talked about how displacement cells. Yeah, we, I think it was here. We talked about displacement cells could represent the difference between a point A in the one space and a point X in another space, or a point A in the same space and a point B in the in the same space uh, between different spaces or the same space. It's the exact same thing. There's there's, there's no difference between them. Um, and so the same module, and I haven't worked out the detail here, could represent both. At one point, I think, I think remember Scott said this. I said, how's this gonna work? And Scott said something like, he says, well, as I move, as I move from, um, uh, uh, as we're moving across the coffee cup at some point, we say, I, at one moment I have a, 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 a grid cell module that represents my location of the cup and I just switch it. And, and now it's gonna represent the quotient on the, on the logo. But as I move there, I'm also, I'm also determining the distance between these two points. And, and so like, it was the idea that the same grid cell module, I'm not phrasing this very well, it was the idea that the same grid cell, uh, displacement cell module, the same displacement model module could, could serve both purposes. One, at one moment, it's detecting how far you're moving. And then when you switch to, it, 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 it's, then it's now gonna represent, as I re-anchor, when I re-anchor my, uh, my grid cell, and it'll now represent the displacement between two points. All right, I didn't explain it very well, but the same, we, we described it in here, somewhere in here, that the same module can do both. And, and so what it, it, there's some trickiness to it. Um, if I, and I didn't talk about that, um, the trickiness gets to the, it's like, it's real easy to imagine the displacement module representing the, the amount of, the, the distance I moved in, within the particular object. But now let's say I'm at a point A on the coffee cup, and I want to say, what's the equivalent point on the logo? Well, I'm actually not moving, but I want to. I want to pretend like I did move, and so I, I, I'm working on an idea here. It's, this is, I'm going to lose everyone on this, but I think I'm working on the idea that the, the very quickly the displacement module will say, "Okay, I'm at. You're at point A on the coffee cup. What you know? What is the equivalent point B on the uh, the point A, uh, on the on the logo? It'll very rapidly run down here until it matches, and it says, "Oh, okay, I know where the logo point should be, and now I'm there." Um, I, it's a hand waving answer, Marcus. It works for me. It works. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All oh, that. Thank you. It makes me happy to hear you say that. Um, but I think it can be done. I don't think I need a separate module. I need some quick switching between them and some fast operations. But um, do you, did I did I get did I convey the, the, the basic idea now better for you? How the yeah yeah it's 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 almost like yeah I, I get it. It's like it's almost like you like interlink these two sets of cells and have them move together. And that's the they do the they, first trick. Of, they will move together because they're in the same mini column, the same uh, or they're seeing the same one D you know vectors column. Um, and so I don't even 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 know if they have to link together. Maybe sure. they do, but but they just move together. And one is just one is just starting at you know putting a tape measure down, saying how far to go, and the other one's saying, okay, I'm at the edge of the table. I'm going to the other edge of the table. Somewhere. <laughs> Anyway, I, I think it's a really, because it, it, this idea that cells had to learn multiple pairs just drove me crazy. I just, I couldn't imagine that happening. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I objected to it when, when displacement cells were first presented. I think I said, I can't see how that's gonna work. Uh, so I, to me, this was like a huge uh, relief for me. A big, and, then, and then it said, oh, and it all seems to play together. So I'm gonna continue working on this. And this is, um, there's more questions here and appreciate I, I would appreciate more questions. They're confusing, it would help me. Um, I guess I'll do one, just one last one. And it really comes back to the first point I made. I'll be curious to see, um, you know, you're, you're really bringing in this constraint from the retina and complex cells. Uh, it's, it's kind of inconvenient. We would almost want the, the rings to update in both directions. We would kind of want uh, th these, these mini yeah. columns to update no matter what direction you're moving, because that would give you path integration. Uh, here, somehow we have to solve that yeah, now. But, but I don't so know, we've, we've read papers where they said that's not happening. Right, um, and I think we've read grid cell papers that say that doesn't happen. Uh, if I recall, uh, do you remember that? That 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 there was some. I need there to. Was, 
I need to was, double check that. It depends. There was on something the about there was something about the the oscillatory interference model that said, "Oh, I know what it was." Is if you moved backward, you would see it was something about the phase precession. It was like there was something that said if the if the if this worked in both directions, then the phase precession wouldn't look like it was <laughs> something like that. And That's so I, remember, I I filed that in my head. And then I also said, I also, you know, then I'm also thinking about the way, then I have this idea that the mini comms and the visual cortex, you're right, based on the visual cortex, are these sort of, they don't fire in both directions, right? They only respond to moving in one direction. You have another column that fires moving in the opposite direction. So I combine those two things and say, okay, well, we'll have to accept that. Um, I wouldn't have thought that. I would have been confused. Like, hey, why can't we go both, you know, forward or backwards? That'd be nice. Um, but it doesn't seem to be. So um, I'm going with what it seems to be. And I think I can make it work this way. Um, there, there's going to be some, yeah, as you pointed out, um, absolutely, there's going to be some some little tricks we have to resolve to make that work. Um, but I, I, overall, okay, but but I, I'm, I'm not discouraged by that. <laughs> I'm saying, okay, this is there's too many things going right here that um, to, um, to 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 say that this is almost certain what's happening um, in my mind. Anybody else? I'm curious, some of the new people here. <laughs> Gosh, Alex, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Have you been following, are you following this? Do you understand this well enough? Yeah, I've gotten um, something of an idea of what you're saying here. Um, it, it definitely helps because I've seen some of the other research videos where you've discussed uh, some similar stuff. Um, not an expert like you, but uh somewhat falling along yeah oh that's good that's good same here yeah like some of the details I, I they go over my head but the overall concept i think yeah sure well that's good i didn't want anyone to be completely lost um you know it, it's strange i actually believe these deals these deals really matter for ai i don't i i still adhere to the belief there's nothing that's swayed me from it that you know these oh we don't have to concern about ourselves about these details um I think in the end, um, AI systems are going to work very, very closely to this. I mean, yes, there will be differences, but I don't think we've gotten down far enough where we can say like, oh, we can abstract all this away. I don't think so. Um, I think these these mechanisms are going to apply, um, and uh, no, obviously not the biological details of the mechanisms. Like you don't have to have this chemical chemistry and the biochemistry and the all that stuff and these can all be modeled and we don't have to have voltage gradients and things like that. But this basic representational scheme that's shown on this page here, I think is gonna be essential. 